This time on episode 419 of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., we talk Moon Knight Disney Plus premiere episode, The Goldfish Problem, weekly Marvel news, including possibly more information on that future secret Marvel Studios space project, some new information on Loki Season 2, and some interesting Disney Plus edits. I'm Willie D. Nelson from All Things Good and Nerdy. A pop culture podcast, part of the Gunna Geek Network. Just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other tantalizingly geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. You have been granted clearance by director Alfonso Mac McKenzie. Stand by for a shield debriefing. All information to be discussed here is classified and may only be discussed among agents granted clearance by the S.H.I.E.L.D. director. Now it's time for a scheduled debriefing. I'm Agent Michelle. I'm Agent Chris. I'm Consultant Anthony. And I'm producer of the show, Director SP. Welcome to Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., a Marvel Comic Universe fan show discussing the Marvel Cinematic and Comic Book Universes as told on screen by Marvel Studios. This show is recorded on Thursday, March 31st, 2022, live from the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. studios and broadcast BBC-wide via www.geeks.live. Come and join our live chat as we record. Everyone, happy National Crayon Day! It's a very colorful uh, holiday. Supposed to be. I mean, when's the last time you took a box of crayons and just had a white sheet and just went to town? I like how you wax philosophical on that. (laughs) I'm not allowed because I end up coloring on the walls. I just know that the world was saved by a yellow crayon. Mm. Well, anyway, today is national. No one watched Buffy. No one watched Buffy. Yeah, I did. I got that reference. Oh, okay. I had nothing to respond to, though. (laughs) Yeah, so anyway, today is National Crayon Day, so make sure you get out and, you know, look at some crayons and, you know, color something that's not on walls, Chris. Don't do the walls. And no cars. Fine. No cars either. Fine. No kitchen table. Gosh, Dad. Actually, our kitchen table is kind of tiley, so I might be able to get mm-hmm. away with that. Well, you can try it. Just a little bit try. See if it'll wipe off and then go to town there. Anyway, Anthony, you have joined us again. You have come to save us, to give us some of that great Moon Knight background, which apparently we need. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to come back as the, I suppose, resident Moon Knight specialist. I'm here to help assist in the debriefing in terms of recapping all the things going on with Moon Knight in the TV show and describing the many, many discrepancies between the television show and the comic version, but looking forward to the discussion. I think it's going to be a good one. We're very grateful to have you because every single reaction that I've seen from people that we know that have followed this show and communicated with us have been, I don't know what the heck I just saw. So we'll get into it later, but thanks for joining us. In the meantime, yes, we love talking about Marvel. Because of mysterious nighttime adventures. You'd like to talk to us about your mysterious nighttime adventures? You can visit our website, legendsofshield.com. You'd like to talk to us about what you get up to in the middle of the night that's family friendly? Leave us a voicemail at 844-THE-BUS-1 or 844-843-2871. If you are constantly woken up in the middle of the night by your cat's mysterious nighttime adventures, be sure to pay the cat tax and let us see it over at Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. on Twitter. you need help staying awake, you can watch us on YouTube at youtube.com slash gonna geek. And remember to enable your Amazon device Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. skill so you can hear more of this great Moon Knight coverage. If you want to keep a journal of all of what you think is happening in your nighttime adventures, maybe start a thread over at gunnageek.com slash discord. 
And remember, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a proud member of the GundaGeek.com network. Well, Moon Knight premiered yesterday on Disney+, Plus, and we all watched it, and we're ready to talk about it. I know Lauren wanted to be here. She couldn't be here because she was busy doing a last-minute thing for a friend, but she is planning on being back with us next week. So say hi to Lauren over on Twitter at SithWitch. In the meantime, are you three ready to talk some Moon Knight? Yeah. Conchu compels it. Maybe. Well, let's get into it anyway. Dive off into the deep end of the pool. Moon Knight episode one premiered on Disney Plus Wednesday, March 30th, 2022. The episode was titled The Goldfish Problem. The IMDb description, I love the IMDb descriptions on new episodes because they're like one sentence long or two sentences long, but basically one line long. It reads, Stephen Grant learns that he may be a superhero, but may also share a body with a ruthless mercenary. Ooh, sounds intriguing. We'll get into that later. Chris, who directed this episode? This one was directed by Mohamed Diab. He has four directing credits starting back in 2010. Six of those are Moon Knight. He also wrote The Island and The Island 2, a pair of movies that I have yet to see, which should surprise nobody. It was an interesting, futuristic sort of thing, I think, if that's the island that I'm thinking of. But I'll check on that and get back to everybody later. Michelle, who wrote the episode? This episode was written by Jeremy Slater, who has nine writing credits starting in 2015, including The Lazarus Effect, the 2015 Fantastic Four screenplay, 20 episodes of The Exorcist, 20 episodes of The Umbrella Academy, and six episodes of Moon Knight. Jeremy is also the showrunner of Moon Knight. Yes, so we can blame Jeremy for any accolades or issues we have with the show. Now, the Moon Knight main cast, there wasn't a lot that was brought forward with this episode. Of course, Oscar Isaac, he's playing Stephen Grant, Mark, and then Moon Knight, although we didn't see him with the wraps on. We just saw the stuntman or Maybe it was Oscar, I don't know. You know him from Star Wars. Yeah, Poe Dameron. That's who he played over there. And we'll get more into Oscar next week. But the one thing that I know about Poe Dameron is he started as a Star Tours character in 2011 and has made his way all the way into the films. Now, I don't know if they knew he was going to be part of the films in 2011 or not. But Oscar Isaac did play Poe Dameron in a Star Tour as the adventure continues in the parks. Interesting about Oscar. Ethan Hawke, on the other hand, he's playing our main antagonist, I think. His character's name is Arthur Harlow. And he goes way back, all the way to 1985 with The Explorers. You guys remember the film The Explorers in 1985? No. That's a no. Hmm. I definitely don't remember it from 1985. Okay, yeah. You'd watch it later on a Saturday afternoon, I'm sure, on FX or something like that. Anyway, it was a kid-based film, kind of like Goonies crossed with Flight of the Navigator, if I'm remembering correctly. He was in that, and then he moved up, and I know you all know this, Dead Poet Society. Yes. Absolutely. It's been forever, but yeah. Okay. That was with the late, great Robin Williams. And then he went on to some other big films, White Fang, Alive. He was uh, basically an extra in Quiz Show, but he was the main character in Gattaca. And everybody in my geek circles that I know likes Gattaca. Very underrated film. Not projecting that on everybody, but a lot of people do enjoy it. Michelle, have you watched Gattaca? Not only have I watched it, but I've used it in science class, and it always freaked out my students when I pointed out to them that Gattaca is a sequence from the DNA basis. It is. Yeah. And they always, because when, yeah, because they're like, well, what would the other side be? And they're just like, oh, that's what it is. Yes. (laughs) I had a professor in college who, for one of the like freshman y, general crap classes 
she would buy a copy of Gattaca every year because she liked teaching it so much, but she also didn't want to use the one copy in the public performance thing that the FBI warning tells you not to do. I could see that, you know, you just don't know when you're going to be taken to jail by the FBI. It's true. Also, Ethan was in Great Expectations in 1998. No, he didn't play Pip. He played Finnegan Bell. He was in Training Day, which if you go to his IMDb page, Training Day is what he is most noted for. I would argue with that and say it would probably either be Dead Poets Society or Gattaca. He was a character that was in the director's cut, not on screen in the theaters in Total Recall, the 2012 version. He was a character in the original Purge movie in 2013. He played in The Magnificent Seven. He was Nikola Tesla in the 2020 Tesla movie, which was probably filmed before the pandemic, I'm thinking. So probably sucks for any movie that came out in 2020 because it didn't receive as much billing as it should have. Matter of fact, movies that came out in most of 2021 didn't either until you got to the back end of that. and. Upcoming, he is going to be in Knives Out 2 later on this year's. Did you guys see the original Knives Out? Yes, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Okay. It's on my list. Chris Evans in a chunky sweater. You can't go wrong. <laughs> Chris Evans is a great. So I was pushed off on watching that. And then one day I was like, okay, I'll just watch it. And was really pleasantly surprised. And I could see how they need a bunch of new characters for Knives Out, too. Chris, have you seen Knives Out? I haven't seen it. Um, from what I've heard about it, it's not something Kaylee would like, so I need to wait till she's gone. Oh, yeah, okay. I think you'd enjoy it, but... Yeah, I could see it being a certain person would like it. Anyway, so those are the characters we're going to talk about this time. There's a few more that we saw, but really, it wasn't a huge cast of characters in this first episode. So now we're going to talk about what happened and we're going to do so in what is now classic Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. fashion. We're going to actually read off our synopsis. We're going to start with Michelle. The show opens with a man customizing his footwear by putting broken glass into his shoes. Stephen takes us through a routine day except for the bit where the co-worker reminds Stephen with a V about their plan to get staked. Some thinly veiled plot points are given, such as the Enid and how ancient Egyptians treated their dead. After work, Stephen talks to his only friend, a statue, a possibly living statue, before he goes home to keep himself from sleeping. Stephen wakes up in the European continent countryside with a voice in his head speaking to him, a vision of a scary ghost and a golden bug in his pocket. Running into the creepy town square, Stephen blacks out again and wakes up with blood on his hands. A cupcake truck chase ensues with bad video game CGI, more blackouts, and a log scene from Final Destination before Stephen blacks out one more time. Everything is not alright though, as Stephen's fish Gus grew a fin back. He misses the hot coworker date by two days and decides to make bad nutrition choices by eating a box of chocolates by himself. After finding a hidden phone and key in his flat, Stephen receives a phone call from Layla before some Ghostbusters scary stuff starts happening. Fleeing the apartment, Stephen is pursued by the weird ghost again before blacking out and waking up on his way to work. The museum is now full of emit cultists and Harrow tries to judge Stephen but can't. In a night at the museum, the exhibits start to come alive, but Stephen finally makes a choice to give up control in order for Moon Knight to save him from the monster. Wow, Michelle, what are your first thoughts of the episode? What? What is this? Just what? I have a habit of falling asleep as we watch things, which is a lot of why I haven't seen a lot of movies. And I completely seriously ask Kaylee if I fell asleep because I feel like I missed something really important here. If I didn't have the primer that Anthony did before we did this series, 
I wouldn't have known what the heck was going on. I mean, I enjoyed it, but it would have been so weird for me that I'm not sure if I would have enjoyed it or not. So I just want to say thank you to Anthony again for the primer and like, what did I dish watch? Well, you're very welcome for the primer. And I would say that as the, again, the resident Moon Knight expert, I was intrigued and I thought that the first episode was incredibly fascinating, but I feel like it would have been better if it was free of the Moon Knight story and character, because so far to me, it doesn't seem all that recognizable as any version of the character I've seen. So we just get winks and nods to the character's history and mythology to keep us saying, oh, I understand that reference, like Captain America. And it's very important to say, oh, I get that reference like Captain America because I do it all the time. All right. So now that we've got that of our systems, let's start talking about the episode. And more importantly, let's start talking about this whole phase in the MCU. Yeah, I'm bringing this up. Big surprise. I'm sure the listeners like, oh, Michelle's doing this. Yeah, of course she is. I'm just trying to figure out how everything fits together. And Moon Knight is this new property. And where does it fit? I'm trying to figure this out. So far, it feels like we've got at least three lines going. We have time multiverse stuff. This is WandaVision, Doctor Strange, Spider-Man, Doctor Strange and Spider-Man. So it counts. Loki and what if. We seem to have this post blip action shows like Falcon and Arena Soldier and Hawkeye. Maybe She-Hulk will fit into that. I don't know. We have space stuff. Guardians of the Galaxy, probably Thor, Nova, probably that's where the Marvels are going to take place, Secret Invasions, because we've got all that going on. So now it comes to Eternals, Chang chi Moon Knight, and Ms. Marvel. Are the Eternals part of cosmic space stuff, or are they separate like God stuff? Are the Eternals the gods that were on the poster that are like supposed to be alluded to? Is there are the rings that Shang Chi uses? Eternals tech, but Wong was in the movie, but so I thought it was connected to Doctor Strange, but maybe not. And now we have Moon Knight, who we have like a god thing, an occult, and then apparently Miss Marvel also has jewelry where got the powers. What it's like this this second book, I kind of see again like all those phases. The first book ended with Endgame, and now we have book two. The phases are chapters. That's how I see it. We have book two, and what? Just what are we supposed to be latching on to here? Because I don't know what to latch on to, and I'm trying to enjoy Moon Knight, and I'm trying to figure out, is this something standalone? Is this an experiment? Or... Is it part of something? I have an idea, and I don't know if you're going to like it, but I'm going to throw it at you anyway. Does it have something to do with Gwen? No, it actually doesn't oh. this time. That'll come later. Nefarious plot thread red herrings. Hmm. Now, okay, that could be true, but perhaps, and I'm just spit balling here. I literally am spitballing here. I'm not just saying that, you know, to run into something, but the scarab might be tech on its own. Like you were saying with the Eternals tech and with Moon Knight, the scarab might be part of that and it might fit in to that line of thought. Now, I could be wrong. I have been wrong before. It's been pointed out many times on this podcast, but at least that's a thread right now. This is just episode one. I'm hoping we get more of that knowledge as we go in, because you're right. Where does it fit? Well, Moon Knight historically has been a street level character. And I envision that despite all of the changes that they've made to the character and the characterization, particularly of Stephen Grant as one of his alters, I believe that they're going to maintain that level of groundedness throughout the show and hopefully throughout his characterization in the MCU, because let's be honest, you don't get Oscar Isaac 
just for six episodes. You get him with the understanding that he's going to make further appearances in the MCU. I would say in terms of where this slots in, this is interesting because this is the first Disney Plus show that is not actually connected to any pre-existing properties because you have WandaVision, which again carries forward the plot points from Wanda and Vision throughout the, the Avengers films. Loki, a Falcon and Winter Soldier carrying on from the Captain America stuff. Even what if it was telling individual stories, but they were all offshoots of the various films. Moon Knight is the first Disney Plus series that is unrelated to anything else we've seen. And this is prior to getting into Ms. Marvel, which will back end into the Marvels. She-Hulk is similarly connected to the Hulk. Moon Knight is really off on his own thing. And again, speaking as the Moon Knight expert, he likes it that way. As a character, Mark slash Moon Knight is very comfortable being left alone in the corner to do his own thing, to fight vampires and werewolves and all that other supernatural type stuff without any involvement from the rest of the Avengers. Wait, wait, wait. You said vampires and werewolves. That weird sword at the end of the Eternals. Could that... You have any Blade. Oh, yeah, yeah, because we have Blade coming. Who is rumored to possibly make an appearance in the show. Mahershala Ali supposedly will find out Mahershala Ali may make an appearance as Blade. We've only ever heard him at the end of Eternals. We may see him, which that would track fighting vampires and things of that nature. Again, I have a lot of thoughts about the characterization of the various alters and the people involved in the show. We are starting to get character crossovers between the films and the Disney Plus series, like an episode long or two episodes long, which is better than just a scene. So like we heard Blade at the end of Eternals, we didn't see him, we heard him and everybody will agree. We heard Blade at the end of the Eternals. We might actually, as you said, see him in an entire episode, whether that's the finale episode or whether that's another episode or a couple episodes. I could see that, actually, and then start to bring stuff together a little bit more there. I can't remember when the Blade movie or series is supposed to come out. I don't even know if it's a movie or a series, to be honest with you. I think they announced film, and as far as I understand, no date has been given yet. Okay, I haven't even seen anything as far as development with it, other than the casting. It would be interesting bringing them that way. We had, what's her name from Falcon and the Winter Soldier, go back and forth between Black Widow. What's her name? Valentina. Yeah, but it's like Madam Hydra, I believe. Well, yes, in, in yes. some variations. Yes, she's, she's also Madam Hydra. I don't know that they may go that route with Julie Louis-Dreyfus this round. I think she's going to be the sort of anti-Nick Fury in that respect. I think that's her role for Phase 4. Is she's going to be recruiting characters that may have less, fewer moral quandaries about killing and things of that nature. And Mark would certainly qualify for that. He would. He would, as would. Oh, is he going by the Patriot? I can't remember. From Falcon the Winter Soldier. U.S. US agent. agent. U.S. Agent. John Walker. Yep. Yeah, John Walker. All right. So, Michelle, does that answer your question, at least for now, give you something to think about? Yes, this is why I bring it up so we can have this conversation and help my brain start to see the cogs and everything. So thank you. That was a good line of questioning. I saw that in there. It's like, good question. Now, Chris, you brought up a question about the character of Moon Knight or Steven or Mark and that the people around him might or might not be noticing some stuff, right? Yeah. How do they not notice that there's something going on here? Like, you've got Steven, the vegan, taking a girl out for steak dinner to a big fancy steakhouse. Maybe you can pass that off 
as just trying to impress somebody you're romantically interested in. But there are so many little things here that I think once you stop to think about it, there's definitely something going on. And just the people in his environment, maybe he just blends in too well or something and they don't care about him. I don't know how long this has been going on. How long have they been, the people around him, like Donna at work, his boss, how long has she had to deal with Steven? Has she dealt with Steven much before? Is she just getting involved now because he's a troubled employee, like showing up late, that sort of thing? I don't know. But great question of how people around him have been viewing him. And not only that, you've got Layla, whoever Layla is on the phone. You've got her wondering what's going on as well. So the other individuals which inhabit the same body might be given the same issue. Uh, Dylan, was she the girl in the, the tour guide in the museum that was going to the steak dinner? How did she not get the difference between Stephen and I'm assuming it's Mark? I don't know. So great question. I don't think she's encountered Mark. Because it seems as though, good grief, here we go. Steven, with a V, he likes to remind people that it has a V in it. I thought that was interesting. People call him Scotty and all different sort of things. He makes the date. He falls asleep. He wakes up in the countryside. When he comes back, he goes to the restaurant. This is what's weird. I've actually had an experience like that. I didn't realize I had stayed up for a very long time and I had no idea what day it was. I thought it was the previous day and such. And they're like, no, Michelle, it's not Saturday, it's Sunday. So it, that is a very odd feeling. Then he calls her, learns it's Sunday, goes, gets the phone call, it's Layla. He's like, who are you? And she's like, Where's Mark? And he's like, who's Mark? So it seems as though Layla has only dealt with Mark. This is the first time she's met Stephen. And it seems as though Mark doesn't show up when Stephen goes to work at the museum doing what he does. I think. It seemed to me that Dylan had made the date prior to meeting Stephen in the morning in the gift shop. I think that date was made before then. And right. Stephen had no memory of it. So I think Dylan had previously met Mark. Or Jake. Okay, that's fair. Now, Jake, I'm throwing out that name. We've not heard Jake or the Jake Lockley Alter, which is one of the comic versions, more established alters slash identities. But there is the possibility that Jake exists in the show, but we haven't met him yet because when he awakens in the field and the voice of Khonshu, as voiced by the legendary F. Murray Abraham, who we also failed to mention in the credits, when he realizes what's going on, he said, oh, the idiot's in control. That, to me, would indicate that maybe there's an option that it's not just Mark and Stephen, that Jake is also present, because Jake is the cab driver alter, the cab driving identity for Moon Knight in the comics. And I'm wondering if maybe Jake was the one who came out during the cupcake chase sequence because Jake would be the very experienced driver. Now, Mark obviously is the mercenary and the one who can shoot his way and kill his way out of a problem, but Jake is the one you want behind the wheel. That is a distinct possibility that maybe Jake also exists and maybe she made the date with Jake, but not Stephen. My thing is, I just want to know how it is that Stephen wakes up on the bus, for example, on his way to work, which means one of the other alters is setting Stephen up to take control. 
we're kind of led to believe that Steven just pops in and takes control randomly when he's not supposed to. But then we see him, he's got the flat. He gets on the bus, but he wakes up. No! Nah! Well, who was in control before that? And why were they on the bus if they're not Stephen? So these are just things that I was taking into consideration. Having said that, the jumps and the blackouts and the way that they're done, I think is the best storytelling conceit that we've seen in the MCU so far. Because what it allows you to do is it says so much without actually showing you anything, and particularly for the level of violence that we've seen in this series, which is just as violent, if not more so, than anything we've seen in the MCU to this point, it allows you to show but not tell, but also not show, because he blacks out, he comes to, his hands are bloodied, people are laying around on the floor, there's a guy in the back of the truck with his head blown open, so we know this happened, but we don't actually see it happen. There's the implication there. And I think that is just a wonderful bit of economy when it comes to uh, storytelling in the MCU. And I'll get into some of the tropes that I don't care for, but I'll take a breather here. If you hadn't known, like us, if we hadn't known Moon Knight's character past, as Many people probably did not going in to watch. I could see them being completely confused. Is this some sort of android? Are we talking multiple personalities? Are we talking he's blacking out and he's doing stuff in his sleep? It is really confusing for somebody that doesn't know Moon Knight at all. And I could see that. I could also see going in, not knowing any of that, but looking at it as a mystery of trying to figure out what's going on, like the actual reflections talking and acting back at you. Is that magic? Is that different personalities? Is this some sort of a matrix, maybe? Those sorts of things can go through your mind as you're watching this, not knowing Moon Knight's background. And it could be a fun discovery period over the next couple of episodes before we start to learn more about what's going on. Yeah, we very much come into this, I don't want to say fully in media res, but the trauma that triggered the fugue states and the various identities has already happened. So now, to your point, SP, it is a mystery because we don't know what triggered it. We don't know how long this has been going on. We don't know a lot of everything. All we know is he's already Steven and Mark and Moon Knight already exists. So he's already... Assuming they follow the comic story, he's already died and been resurrected by Khonshu. And so what I'm hoping and I believe we're going to get throughout the next couple of episodes is hints and filling in some of that backstory. But it's interesting that where they drop us off is he's already been established and we have to fill in the pieces as we go. Now, Michelle, you also brought up another great point in the show notes that I feel like we have to discuss. You asked the question, is this post blip? Now, just by chance, I might say, yeah, it is post blip, but we've had Black Widow and that's pre blip. So I don't know. Michelle, do you have a thought here? So far, no one, it's really odd. No one's really talking about it. You can't really tell. If it's during the blip, it would explain how Steven still has a job because in reality, he would be fired. But with a reduced population, you would have a reduced workforce, but then you would still need jobs. I know this is awful to say, but he would be fired. And even if, I know this is England and such, but he comes in late. He doesn't really focus on his work. It's just interesting. And then talking about, because if it's during the blip, then it might help explain how certain Moon Knight things happened. Is this multiple person? I almost put like, it almost feels like possession. Some people might actually might think it's possession, just the way it might be shot. But 
going off of what like Chris was saying about people not realizing, why hasn't he seen a doctor? Why? I can't sleep. I'm there are many multi medical reasons as to this. There are night terrors. There are people who sleepwalk. There's actually a sleep disorder where people will sleepwalk and they will wake up and they they were like, I went to bed and now I'm in my front yard. I don't know how this happens. They do have to have like monitors and, and everything with them. It's an actual medical thing. Prescription drugs have done this. Here's the thing. I mean, right now, England has national health care. Why hasn't he seen a doctor? Why hasn't anyone been like, hey, you don't look all that great. Here, let me help you find a doctor. Let's go to the doctor together. Is he actually talking to his mother or is he just talking on the phone thinking that he's talking to his mother? And if that's the case, why? It's just a lot of whys right now because I'm just trying to make sense of because he's strapping himself in. And just like Anthony was saying, there's if, if you got another personality, if you're able to wake up, you're still going to be able to take off your restraints, go do the thing, come back home, put up the tape again, and go back in and strap yourself in and then go back to sleep and then have Steven wake up thinking nothing's wrong. It's just, it's very, it's just, this is like weird. I, you know, I, it is. A very interesting first episode. And I hope the next one, I really don't want this to be one of those, it doesn't get good until episode four. This really needs to get good in episode two. Oh, I wasn't even thinking about that till you just said it. Please don't bring that evil into the world. This whole thing, though. I mean, I'm with you. Where are these other people coming in? Where are they coming from? What are they doing? I think he might have a hard time getting the sand fix that he spreads out around the bed so he can check out footprints, but every other little bit of security that he has around his bed and in his flat, you can fix that so easily. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm just living in a world where everybody that I know in England is saying, hey, you know, I, I can go to the doctor for whatever I want. and. He's not going, and that's what I'm getting stuck on. Because obviously there's something wrong. Well, there is the, from what I've heard from British fans of Moon Knight, as well as Londoners who've watched the show, they say that the accent isn't quite Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins bad, but that it's definitely off. And I think the reason for that is because he's not really British. So for Oscar Isaac to play him with a quote-unquote bad British accent is actually true to the character because the whole idea of Stephen is this facade. And so I think that plays in to a lot of things. I'm curious to see where that goes in terms of the Britishisms and the, the accent and things of that nature. I know Michelle had brought up the phone and we've mentioned Layla and, and the ringing. One thing is I hate the trope of a phone ringing as soon as a character picks it up. And I know it's a storytelling conceit and I know it happens in every form of media, but it just, it bothers me. And it's just, it's one of those, it's a me problem. And I fully accept that. But just the idea that he's like, oh, here's this phone. Ring. Oh, it's ringing let me answer it but also i just i did want to point out that he was going when he was scrolling through all of the missed calls it's all layla except for the one name that stuck out is duchamp which if you remember from the primer jean paul duchamp is frenchy his sidekick so we've established that a frenchy does exist within this universe and it was the 32nd missed call and moon knight debuted in werewolf by night number 32 so I thought that was a fun little Easter egg, mythology gag, what have you, that they threw in there for those eagle-eyed fans 
such as myself, because, you know, I was one of the handful of people like, it's Frenchy, and it's number 32. I understand that. Yeah, I have the similar issue with the phone ringing right when you turn it on, unless it's you're being watched or, yeah, you're being watched and the phone rings as soon as you pick it up or turn it on because somebody can tell that you've just picked it up. Like in the Matrix. Yes, like in the, exactly, that's what I was thinking. When Neo gets the phone out of the package and then he clicks it open, it automatically starts ringing or it rings and then he clicks it open. Anyway, since I just watched that because I just watched all four of the Matrix movies. Totally get that. It's mm. Layla is not watching. If she was watching, she would know what was going on with Mark, but she's not, or at least that's what I'm led to believe at this point. She just happened to call at that very specific time. I don't think so, especially since she's got what 31 calls between when Duchamp tried to call. I don't know. And Mark's normal accent or Oscar's normal voice comes up in the mirror right before the end there when he says, look, I'll get us out of here. You're not going to die, but you have to give control over to me. And that is Oscar's voice that we know through Poe Dameron. If you've not seen him in anything else, at least Star Wars, you get to see him there or hear him there. So I agree that bad accent and probably doesn't have access to the healthcare just because he's not a citizen maybe that's definitely a possibility although he is working so i'd presume that they would want to you know if you're working to have some kind of protection for you somehow yeah like a green card i don't know what they do over in the uk it's probably not a green card probably something else i'll make it my mission to find out okay before good. the next episode I hope we actually get to see some of these fights because so far we have not seen any fights. We have just seen it is going to happen, blackout, and then it's happened. We did see a little bit of beat down in the bathroom with Moon Knight in the character in the costume at the very end, but that's it. We saw nothing else other than Steven driving around the cupcake truck, <laughs> which that was funny. Just, you know, cupcake truck and chase and this is not the first time in this phase that we've seen what I would call video game-esque car chases. And it's starting to bug me a little bit. Maybe this is not being shown to me as a primary audience. Those over 50, those that are AARP age, you're just supposed to say, oh, whatever, I can get over it. That is my point that I can't get over. They are very, I mean, it's good. Don't get me wrong, but I could tell that is not a real car chase and that you're getting cars moving in a way that they're not supposed to. So I know it's not really happening. I mean, good on you for showing it to me, but I have an issue with that. I kind of heard the Benny Hill theme song when that car chase was going. <laughs> I don't know if any of you know what I'm talking about. That's a very old reference because... Fast and Furious, it was not. And talking about not being able to see, boy, they really saved a lot of money by having the museum be dark and some weird CGI thing chasing. I did not really feel like, are they in danger? I can't see anything because the museum is dark. I know it wasn't this, but my mind went to the dogs in the 80s Ghostbusters movie that's what i thought i was seeing and i know it's not but that's what i was thinking so well that's better than me i was thinking the dogs in the hulk movie oh we dare not speak of those they're the best part of the movie there is no such thing the Incredible Hulk is finally streaming somewhere. It's just not on Disney Plus. So that has been a contention for many fans that have wanted to see the entire MCU all the way from the start for a very long time. You're just not going to get that case on Disney Plus. I have the opposite sleep issue, by the way, where I don't have trouble trying to stay awake. I have trouble going to sleep and keeping asleep. And I've done all sorts of things to try to keep sleeping. The end result is almost the same, which is sleep deprivation, but 
I find it a little difficult to relate to. I just black out and then can't wake up on time or something like that. So anyway, that's just me personally, but I do understand sleep issues anyway. Yeah. As, as the parent of a toddler, I, I also understand sleep issues <laughs> and I'm about to be the parent of a newborn. So I'm going to understand it all over again. Right. Maybe that's where I went wrong with three kids and then dogs and stuff. So Anthony, you being the Moon Knight aficionado on this podcast, what do you think of the costume? Because you actually got to see the costume at the very end. So, again, I understand that they wanted to go for something in theory a little more grounded. And so I think from an artistic standpoint, this draws very heavily from the Earth X version of Moon Knight, which if you go through the credits and you look at the thank yous, one of the thank yous is Alex Ross, who designed and drew the Earth X version of Moon Knight, which is basically the mummified version. He's still in all white with the cape, but the white is mummy mummified wraps. And so I feel that this was very much the costume design was an homage to the Earth X version. I have less of an issue with the costume itself than I do with how it sailor moons onto his body, because that's the best way that I can describe how it sort of just wraps around him. And I was expecting him to like spin around and go like, yatta at the end, and throw up the peace sign because of just how it just sort of comes on to him. No version of Moon Knight I've ever read has that ability. I don't know where that came from. I don't know why, but it's just something that irks me. And like I said, that irks me more than the costume itself. The costume itself, I'm like, okay, I could see where they get some of it, even though I think the use of the giant crescent dart in the middle of the chest plate that he's able to like pull out, which we'll see in future episodes that he's able to pull out and put back. I'm like, that just, if that's sitting right on your chest, that feels incredibly restrictive. But like I said, how it just envelops him. No. Maybe on his chest, he's got that bag that Hermione has over in the Harry Potter series where, you know, you can just reach in and like a bottomless bag, you can pull out like whole tents and cars and stuff. Like Felix the cat. Yeah. His magic bag. I would have liked that better than the Sailor Moon Knight that we were seeing in the show. Okay, do we want some historical context for things on your chest like that? I'm down. All right. My wife and I do some historical reenacting. It's uh, 1670s in Charleston, South Carolina. So in her stays, which are basically... Think a corset and you're close enough for this conversation, one of the things that, ironically enough, she says makes it more comfortable for her is literally a stick. Think probably about a thumb wide and maybe about as long as my face, something like that, and just stick it right down the middle of her stays. And for whatever reason, she says that makes it more comfortable. But also, the bad part about her And the other girls that are there wearing it and have that thing, which has a name, I just can't remember what it is. If we go and try to eat too early when they feed us and stuff, they will pull that thing out and whap us with it. So there is historical context for having weaponry right there on your chest. Got to protect the food. It's true. I mean, they know what I'm going to do to the cookies. They really, I deserve it. Well, thank you for that. That was incredibly enlightening and I stand corrected then. Hers isn't sharp, though, so I don't know what that would do to it. Have to protect it, that's for sure. So, in any good series, in all of the Disney Plus Marvel series so far, there has been stuff that's been given to us in episode one that comes back in the finale, right? So, what in episode one are we going to see in the final episode? Chris, what do you think? I think that Steven is going to learn that a medium rare steak is definitely the way to go. 
I also think is something is going to come back and bite him because they're going to notice that he stole the money out of that uh, sand pyramid display. Do you think he's going to stay with the center cut fillet or you think he's going to try something else like a porterhouse? I don't know if he'll go that far. Honestly, if it was me, I'd go for a nice skirt steak, but he's new. He'll probably go with whatever cut they say, but get it medium rare. Okay. Anthony, what do you think is going to come back? I think the notion that only seven of the gods, they referenced that only seven of the gods from the Aeneid are referenced in the poster and that two of them are missing. And I believe that the two are going to be Amit and Anshu. I'm also wondering, though, if we're going to see anything on Set, Seth, because Set is a bad dude in the Egyptian mythology, and particularly when dealing a lot with Khonshu, that there's a lot of bad blood there. So I'll be very curious to see how much of the real Egyptian mythology is utilized for the characters and the characterization of Khonshu. You know, I, I like the the fact that Kanchu is kind of a dick, for lack of a better term, to Stephen and even theoretically Mark, because that tracks from the comics. I want the guy with the brooms, the selling of the cart. I want that to be in a chase, has to be knocked over. He has to go. My brooms, because we, you know, Michelle loves her avatar references in any and all medium. All right. I don't know what we're going to get back. I think maybe possibly the little girl or what they were talking about with the heart needing to pass through at the end. I don't know what kind of mythology they're really going to build here. And if it's really tied into that Eternals tech, I don't know what that means either. So I think I need a little bit more to go on before I say something. I would say the cart is something that I was thinking as well, but I don't know. Because why would you put that throwaway scene in there of the guy with the brooms, the cart, just in front of the door if you're not going to use it later? It's just my thoughts. All right. I'm going to watch the next episode. I know. Everybody here is as well, so we'll see what's going on. Now, Anthony, that you probably won't be joining us next week, so you'll probably be coming back in two weeks. So you have anything to say before you come back? I actually have a question. I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt, but I have two questions for Anthony. It's really bugging me. Go for it. Is Haro an actual character from the comic book, and is this cult? from the comics as well or is this just something for the tv show harrow the name arthur harrow is the name of a character that appeared in one moon knight comic however his characterization and everything else about him is completely new for the show and jeremy slater i saw a tweet indicated that they did that because he felt that Roel bushman who i and many moon knight fans considered to be moon knight's primary nemesis jeremy slater felt was too close that bushman was too close to killmonger from black panther and he didn't want to repeat that and so what he said is that he and ethan hawk really created this harrow character using the name and basically nothing else from he was he was a doctor i think and he was in, like I said, literally one issue of the story. And so there's a lot of rumors that he may have been the Sun King from the Max Bemis run on the comics, but there's no indication whatsoever that they're doing anything with the Sun King story. So I would say, yes, he's very much an original character just with the name of this one-off. So there's nothing in the mythology or the IP about the cane that's balancing back and forth in that tattoo, nope. which is Ahmet and Justice and stuff like that? Nope. Wow. That's all new. And that is probably, I would say, largely due to the Egyptologist that they had as a consultant on the show. And so I do credit them for incorporating 
some of that authentic Egyptian mythology into the show. It's just a matter of time, like I said, before we see how much other stuff gets incorporated into that. And also, the one other thing I did want to add, Michelle, I know, I think it was Michelle, you were talking uh, very early on that he was talking to the statue, and you questioned whether that was a statue or it's a living statue. It is a living statue, and his name is Crawley, which is based on Bertrand Crawley, who is one of Mark Spector's very closest confidants. And so the idea that they've converted Crawley from this very learned bum, essentially, who drinks, uh, who drinks tea while continually reusing the same very, very old and stale tea bag. The fact that they've converted him into a living statue as a character, I think, is, is a fun bit. And that I'm okay with, that little tweak there. But he's credited in the episode as Crawley. So I'm hoping we see a lot more of him as well. Not only that, but he is in a fountain too, which is reusing water, right? Yeah. There you go. Environmentally friendly. In London. Got to be environmentally friendly. I'm just really interested in seeing where all this cult stuff goes, because as I'm watching this, I'm feeling like this cult and Ethan Hawke's character is kind of the more evil version of what Klaus has going on in Umbrella Academy. Interesting. Interesting. I've not watched the Umbrella Academy. I will tell you, though, uh, it's funny you bring up Klaus because on my show, Capes on the Couch, we're coming back, well, I guess, the week of April 4th, and the episode that week is on Klaus Hargreaves. I swear I didn't know that. Yeah, well, there you go. It's interesting that you, that you bring him up because, yes, we're covering the seance. That'll be next week. All right. Michelle, anything left? No, Anthony helped me through that. Awesome. Chris, anything left? No, I think I'm good until the next episode inevitably confuses me some more. All right, Anthony, you probably won't be here for a couple of weeks. That's what we're thinking. So you got anything left for this? Yeah, I wish I could be here next week, but uh, I will be uh, otherwise occupied. But I will listen to your coverage of episode two, and I may just shoot you some notes that you can feel free to incorporate into your discussion. And I look forward to joining you for for episode three. I can guarantee you the entire episode two will be me reading a line from your notes, Chris reading a line from your notes, Michelle reading a line from your notes. That's what the entire podcast is going to be. However short or long your notes are, however short or long our podcast is going to be. Good to know. We will be covering Moon Knight episode two next week, assuming that Disney Plus does publish the episode two or drop episode two next week. That's what we'll be doing next week, and hopefully we'll start to get some answers. In the meantime, we do have some brief Marvel Studio news to get to. Well, first up, Marvel is developing a Nova project with Moon Knight Rider. While Guardians of the Galaxy first teased the Nova Corps back in 2014, Deadline is reporting that fan favorite Marvel hero Nova will finally be getting their own project from Moon Knight Rider Sabir Rosada. The outlet notes that it isn't known at this point if the project is being developed as a Marvel Studios film or TV series. But just earlier this month, reports emerged that Marvel was moving forward on a new space theme project, with it being possible that a Nova TV series is that secretive project. There we go. More space stuff. Well, this is on the tail end of that secret project that happened to pop up, right? And then you uncovered this. So I could definitely see this as the Nova core coming up. Now, whether it's the New Avengers version of nova or the adult version of nova i don't know what they're going to do i don't know what direction that they're headed in but i could see nova coming out especially with the guardians of the galaxy 3 slated to come out and stuff like that and i'd be stoked actually to get more of the space part of marvel because i don't know a lot of it but so far what i've seen has been awesome so if that's what we have here it's gonna be awesome 
I would imagine as much as I love Richard Ryder as a character, I believe that they're going to go with Sam Alexander because so many of the characters that they're establishing for Phase 4 are on the younger side. Kate Bishop, Kamala Khan, we're likely going to see, in theory, a Miles Morales at some point. And so they're definitely setting up the... Oh, and, and Cassie Lang is going to be in Quantumania. So they are absolutely setting up a Young Avengers slash New Warriors type of team. And Sam Alexander would absolutely fit in with that younger cohort of newer Avengers that they can build phase four and presumably five and six around because so many of the older characters, they've had their run. It's time for some new blood. Or they can just do it as champions, which means you get the Ghost Spider crossover, and then I'm happy. And there it is. Whatever you get, that was my point. I don't know if we're going Young Avengers, Champions, whatever you want to call them, West Coast Avengers, versus the actual uh, Avengers. Yeah, I do see them going that way. And if you look on the bottom of our show notes, every week there is an untitled project that hasn't been named yet that we're projecting to be the young adventures so that is what we're looking at or what we're predicting we'll see what happens and that's based on everything you just said anthony so many characters have already been introduced even eli over on falcon and the winter soldier i don't think you mentioned eli over there no you're right i forgot him yeah okay so moving on we're going to talk about a low-key season two It just so happens that some of the same people working on Moon Knight have been tapped to go over to Loki. And who are we talking about? Two of the directors that will direct episode two and I believe episode four of Moon Knight, Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead. They have a couple of quotes here, and I believe it starts with Justin. Quote, we know that the thing that appeals to us about Loki and Moon Knight specifically, it's just among the MCU. They feel like outsiders. And there's something about that that we really relate with. And then Aaron Moorhead goes on and he says, quote, I think the biggest thing about Loki is just that it's actually a lot like Moon Knight, where there's just no reason to do it if it's not going to be something new and fresh. What's funny is it does feel like Marvel would be willing to walk away unless it's actually is something that they felt the unexpected like from Moon Knight, and especially because Moon Knight is a character where nobody knows almost anything about him yet. Soon to be changed, right? So our gloves are off, and we get to kind of do whatever we want. And everybody at Marvel and ourselves gets really excited when we are presented with the unexpected. We also, of course, hope that people watching feel the same way, and we're going to bring all that to Loki, unquote. So they're reusing some of the same behind the camera folks to shape Loki season two. I know we were worried. We weren't worried, but we were curious about what was going on with Loki season two because Kate Heron decided to leave the project. And a lot of people do that. They'll do a season of something and then they'll move on and do a season of something else. Some actors like Jared Harris, there's a, a good example of a great actor who's in the zone and he jumps from project to project to project. So I can't fault. Kate, none of us can fault Kate for moving on, but that means that that void had to be filled by somebody. And it looks like Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead are two of those people. So, you guys comfortable with that sharing of talent between Moon Knight and Loki? It depends on how Moon Knight goes. That's fair. That's fair because we had that issue with what's his name, Scott with Inhumans that also did Iron Fist. Iron Fist, yeah. That was consistent in quality. It was uh, Scott Buck, and and yes, to Chris's point, it was consistent in quality. It was consistently dog feces. Well, we covered it before on this show, and you can say that there's a trend with Scott, but also Scott came in very late to both projects, so he might not have had the creativity he needed. I don't know. What I do know is he hasn't gotten anything else, so... We don't know what Scott is up to these days. All right, Chris, what is going on with Disney Plus? That is a really good question. Do y'all remember last episode when I said that 
the big change was that they were just taking the Netflix name out of the credits. Yep. Yes. Ha, jokes on you. They're editing some more stuff. Not with the Netflix shows though. What's happening now is that people have noticed that up on Disney Plus, there are some new cuts, I guess is a good way of saying it, of the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. This is really weird because why would you go through the extra effort to make less violent looking scenes from a TV show unless you're going to have the intention of putting that out? I'm conjecting here. I'm thinking here that there maybe possibly were throwing around the idea internally of a less violent version for people who didn't have that adult content allowed setting on Disney Plus, and then they could have the same story. They just wouldn't have the blood and everything, kind of like seeing sweat in Mortal Kombat. But I don't know if it's a good idea. Well, here's a thought. Maybe during the summer television season, you know how they either do reruns or throwaway shows or a lot of reality TV. They might be thinking to put Falcon and the Winter Soldier on ABC, even, or one of the cable channels just to throw it out there on quote unquote linear TV because linear TV is not just broadcast. It's everything that's on cable and satellite TV, right? So that could be a thought or it could be the whole, we want this stuff to be available to all viewers, whether or not you've clicked the pin in to make your accounts with whatever. Now I want to clarify here. So there have been some alternate cuts of Falcon and the Winter Soldier that were uploaded, but there is an Entertainment Weekly or EW.com article that says they have learned that an alternate version of the show has been uploaded by mistake. Disney is currently working to fix the issue. Okay, so an alternate version was thrown up there. They're throwing the original version back up, but that gets back to your question, Chris, is why did they create this alternative cut to begin with, right? And the thing is, looking at the comparisons, it's not like there's any kind of story change with it. It's not huge things. It's just, it's literally somebody's lying on the ground and there's not blood all over their face. It's, you don't see a pipe going through somebody. It's the things that, as far as the storyline and the plot go, you're perfectly fine not seeing it. And I can understand why people would go out and yell, oh, you know, there's censorship there. Let us see the original version. But this is a version that you can sit around and watch with your three-year-old and your grandma at the same time. Yeah, it uh, it was definitely kind of jarring. I did see some of those posts and the the edits done. I'm wondering if it be also a situation where I think it was Michelle or Chris, somebody had indicated that you know, they're trying to maybe market this for the folks that didn't unlock the parental controls. Because also, let's remember that right after Disney bought Fox, they released the Deadpool Christmas, whatever version of Deadpool 2, in an effort to make a PG-13 rating as opposed to the R. So I'm wondering if that might be them testing the waters some more to see if there's a market for the slightly less gory version of the story. And also uh, had to Chris for throwing out the sweaty Mortal Kombat as a Super Nintendo owner. That was a real pain in my tuchus back when I was in those gaming days. It wasn't until like Mortal Kombat 2 or 3 that we got the blood on the SNES and I was able to see everything just like it was in the arcade. So thank you for those flashbacks to 20 years ago. Linear TV, people who don't want the violent content. Also, I think Disney Plus isn't in every country yet, and some countries have certain standards. They might be editing certain products in order to expand Disney Plus into other countries. Good point. All right. Well, we'll keep our tabs on it as we have the past few weeks. Chris won't let me not keep tabs on it because he says, SP, if we don't talk about this, I quit the show. And 
Well, I would be okay with that. I know, Chris, your fans would not. So we're going to try to keep you employed on this show and keep on talking these articles. Every time they make weird edits, we have to cover it. It's contractually obligated at this point. <laughs> How contractually obligated. Okay. All right. Great show, guys. Michelle, what should we do now? I think we need to hijack a cupcake truck and get on out of here. Well, Anthony, thank you very much for hijacking or stowing away on the cupcake truck so that you could be on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. this week. I mean, I know those boxes are pretty small, but if you put them in front of you just right, then you can, you know, stow away just like you're on a jumbo jet to Europe. So thank you for doing that for our fans here on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. No problem. It's great to be back and looking forward to continuing the conversation. Like I said, I I wish I could be here next week for episode two, but it is my plan to be here for the other four episodes, three through six. And it's our plan to have you. So in the meantime, where can people find you when you're not here? When I'm not here, I am co-hosting my other show, Capes on the Couch, which is an examination of the psychiatric and mental health issues of superheroes. We have covered Moon Knight. And in fact, one of our upcoming episodes is going to be a Moon Knight Redux. We're going to take another look at the character update it from the four years ago that we did the first episode we are on facebook instagram and twitter at capes on the couch our website is capes and you can find us on basically every podcatcher except for spotify i do have a quick question for you i meant to search this on your website before we went live tonight but i didn't so i'm just going to ask you directly have you done an episode on squirrel girl yes yes we did okay So there you go for our Squirrel Girl fans out there. It was actually one of my favorite episodes to do. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for everyone for listening and downloading and watching us. If you want to hear more from me, you can find me on Twitter at shell underscore game. Also, the VOD for the game that I was in this week, we did it for the, the Transgender Texas Bundle. It was a charity where I got to play Optic, a basically an internet path gremlin goblin who liked to wrap herself up in a blanket and just go, here's everything on the internet, there you go, sort of character. It was fun. Again, it's the uh, Nerds with Dice channel. It'll be up on our YouTube channel within the week. It was fun to play. We played the Exceptionals system which is new by Sahone. you can find that on itch.io we played mutants it was like a cool x-men Sahone was inspired by the x-men play he wanted to create the x-men game that he wished he could play i did put a link to the twitch video in our previous show notes but i know that doesn't last very long so i'll make sure i put a link to the youtube video when it's posted because as we're recording this it is not posted yet but i will put a link to the exceptionals one shot that you guys did in the show notes for today assuming that it's up by the time this publishes and if you want to hear more from me the best place to do that is to go over to playcomics.com where funnily enough now that you mention x-men you have made the decision for me the episode that is coming up next is going to be looking at X-Men Wolverine's Rage with Didge from Geekset Podcast. But if you're listening to this before that comes out, the newest episode will be my talk with Lydia and David Shearer about a Kickstarter game, Cat Magic, the game, which goes with a series of books that Lydia is writing that my wife is really into, and I read one of them to get familiar with everything, and I'll probably go back and read the rest of them, despite the fact that this book does not have many pictures in it. I did listen to that podcast and they did mention that they were going to have physical copies of that game available in the Louisville and Lexington, Kentucky areas. And since I live within driving distance of those places, it might be a weekend trip that I take to some of the stores that they said in your podcast. I would encourage everybody to listen to that episode that Chris just did with Lydia and David. Well, that's it for this week. I know we got to get going because, well, we're all busy adults and we got stuff to do. Until next time, I'm Director SP. 
I'm Agent Michelle. I'm Agent Chris. I'm Consultant Anthony. All right. See everybody next time. Bye. 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 Bye, y'all. Eat your broccoli. But also the cupcakes. Don't waste those. Thank you for listening. If you want to leave us feedback, go to gunageek.com and you will find all our contact information and other shows. You can also visit legendsofshield.com where you'll find our complete archive of podcasts. The music heard on this podcast is by Kevin McLeod, found at incompetech.com and also artists on pond5.com and audiojungle.net. The opinions heard on this podcast are those of the individual hosts and do not represent Stargate Pioneer Productions, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., or Gunna Geek. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is the property of the Disney Corporation, Marvel Studios, and ABC. No infringement is intended. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is copyright 2013 through 2022.